thing, right, is you go to Ikea and mm -hmm. you have to walk through the whole thing, right? Yeah. But you want to have dinner and the dinner is really good. But every single time I go to Ikea, I, For the want, price. I want the hot dogs. Right. But, but I'm like, the when's the last the time I had a hot dog? Because oh, are we? Because Aaron wants to have dinner, and right. Maddie wants to have dinner, and are then we, I, well, I'm going to walk around IKEA without having are food. Are we live, guys? And, make them wait and to get a hot dog. we are so live. Okay, great. Hi. Yeah. Hey. Welcome back, TCS TV viewers. It is the Saturday live show, uh, depending on where morning. in the world you are, <laughs> or afternoon, or evening, or absolutely. Or That's the beauty of live TV. Uh, we're here back with another special guest. We're really liking this. We're trying to get a lot of special guests, yep. and we're here with Rob Galbraith, mm -hmm. who is the a grand poobah of uh, the state <laughs> photojournalism program. <laughs> Topical. I asked him to give me a title. That's the title he gave me. So, grand poobah. Uh, but you run the state photojournalism program. I'm one of, one of three instructors. One there, of yes. three instructors. There yes. you are. And uh, you've been on a live show before. No. And well, uh, he's been on our TCS TV our episode TCS TV for our NC2000 episode. We brought him out, and everybody was like, oh my God, I used to read robgalbraith.com. I miss Rob. What's Rob up to? So we said, Let's get Rob on the show. Yeah, and we're giving you guys more Rob. And he will give you the entire breakdown of the last half decade or so. Uh, de a detailed <laughs> sure. account. Yeah, basically <laughs> today's live show is just going to be an hour-long um, uh, novella where Rob is just going to tell you about the, uh, the decades past in digital technology. That's not true. That's not true. <laughs> we're not going to do that. But Rob is in a very unique position because you have seen this world of photography transition mm -hmm. from film photojournalism to the new digital era, mm -hmm. to you know the modern cameras that we yeah. appreciate today. And not only that, but you've seen and now taught all of these people that are starting out in mm -hmm. these different uh, eras as well, right? So you, you have very good insights into this whole digital world. I hope so, I hope mm -hmm. so. So I do wanna lead off, um, I owe you a favor, because when I started at the camera store, um, I thought I was kind of like hot stuff, <laughs> not the word I was about <laughs> yet, uh, when I came over here, but I hadn't really dealt with a lot of professionals before. So your site totally saved my ass when oh, I great. jumped over here. Um, I thought that the 1D3 seemed like a great camera when I started at the <laughs> store. And uh, no, it was a very valuable insight, and especially cards and memory cards and stuff like that. I know it was you know, a very valuable resource. We miss it. But um, that's how I kind of got familiar with, with you, certainly. And then coming into the store for the last little while after that, I found it's always really interesting to get your insight working with the students um, because you have a very strict set of what cameras they can use, um, what yes. you find acceptable in a professional field. And that's why I thought it would be really interesting to talk to you today because um, the mirrorless transition is certainly happening right now. It's, mm -hmm. it's really kind of taken over at the consumer side but we're starting to see it making inroads on the professional and your standards are like militant mm. standards for acceptability <laughs> in a camera. So I w yeah, I want to talk to you about what you think yeah. is. I mean, let's who's talk got the that. best shot at breaking through to that? Well, yeah, what are the challenges first off um, in a camera being acceptable for journalism? I mean, what kind of stuff are you saying to the kids? Like we, if you're going to get a camera for journalism, these are the things it has to excel at. Well, first and foremost, it has to support you in the capturing of moments. So whether or not you are shooting sports or news or feature pictures or anything else, uh, the camera you have in your hand needs to be able to work with you, support you in the capturing of moments. And as soon as it doesn't do that, as soon as it has a flaw that is, that is preventing that from happening, it is, it's, it's the wrong camera. Right. Unfortunately, right now, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of cameras coming from primarily Canon and Nikon that do support, well, any photographer, including students, right. in that endeavor. Uh, and, but one of the things that those two makers are not really focusing on is cameras that shoot silently. Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of applications within photojournalism where truly being able to be a fly on the wall, not just because of how you, how you move around a right. room, but also by virtue of having a camera that makes no noise, that is really, right. really attractive. Right. Hmm. Well, and we're already seeing there was a big announcement about the PGA, how now they're really pushing mm. the Sony A9 for that because you'll be able to capture the backswing, which they've yes. always said mm. no photography during that because it's distracting to the golfers. Right. Um, so right. I think yeah. we're going to, once the word gets out, you know, same thing like, um, you know, press conferences, stuff like, especially like, you know, funerals, something like that, anything sure. that's a more sensitive moment. When the word gets out, oh, these people can have cameras that aren't going to make noise. I can certainly see some people saying no cameras with shutters. Well, I was just sure. looking at you know uh, Paul Souza's work, right? He he was uh, Obama's official photographer, or, or right? Pizza, uh, yes. Oh, Pete Souza, sorry, yes. Pete Souza's yeah. work, right? And he's uh, he's shooting all this stuff very fly on the wall, right? Very yeah. much in a situation where you can't be attracting attention. You don't want people looking at you. So 
applications like that for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and he would be a great example of, even though he mainly shot with a uh, digital SLR, right. maybe exclusively shot with a digital SLR, mm -hmm. it, was, it was mainly a 5D Mark III, and mm -hmm. um, almost certainly he had that set to its so-called silent shooting mode, right. which was not silent, but it was uh, it, it was a little bit more discreet. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah. Uh, ah. That is actually a quite a nice feature of that camera, is that when you put it in its so-called silent shooting mode, it is quite quiet. It really does reduce, reduce the sound. Now, we've had mirrorless cameras, though, on the market now for quite a long time, and some very capable ones. Mm. So... Why, why is it that only now are we seeing mirrorless cameras maybe start to become a viable journalistic tool? Yeah, what's or been holding them back? Are you seeing yeah. mirrorless cameras becoming a viable tool? Well, I think, I think 2017 is, is the transition year. Mm -hmm. uh, whether 2018 is the year where it becomes real for sure, or whether it's 2019 or mm -hmm. 2020, I mean, that I, that I don't know. But for sure, 2017, in particular with what Sony is doing, mm -hmm. it does say that that future, that future is coming. And maybe that future is coming uh, first from Sony. Uh, maybe it'll be somebody else. But what they've done in the in the A9 signals both that the impediments that mirrorless had presented to capturing moments effectively, things like uh, viewfinder lag, uh, mm -hmm. would be would be a key one of right. those. Yeah. Um, uh, I do uh, a fair bit of. Of live play photography, like the you know, like uh, stage photography. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, and when shooting that, I mean, when shooting during uh, a performance, I have to shoot silently. And I've used a mix of mirrorless cameras for doing that over the past three years, including the Sony A6500. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And, and with that camera, you have uh, three frames per second with a fairly significant blackout between frames. Yeah. Um, and the a shutter button that is, doesn't have a great feel to it. Mm. So I, I found with the A6500 that I was simply strafing a lot of scenes, just holding that button down, hoping, hoping, hoping there was going to be a, right. a moment in there. Which is not really a great way to be creatively capturing the moment you're trying to capture. All. No, yeah. no, not at all. Yeah. And then making sure I had extra batteries with me because battery life <laughs> is a problem. Uh, with that camera also, uh, when shooting a, a two-hour play, my eye, my right eye, would be really tired by the uh, end in a way that was, that was never, ever true uh, when using an optical viewfinder. Right, right, of course. Uh, but fast forward to, to the A9, and, uh, and all of what I just described goes away. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there's still, there's still plenty about the A9 that, that needs work. Right, um, okay. So the, the fact that you can move the autofocus point around so easily, the fact that you could go out with just one battery and be able to cover an entire long event, including for me, say, a two-hour stage play. Right. Uh, that's fantastic. The view, the the electronic viewfinder is is so good that I no longer experience um, the strain, eye, the, and yeah, the eye strain, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep, that kind of thing. I know shooting the A9. I don't know when our video is going to come out. If <laughs> if our video is going to come out, <laughs> but I yeah I yeah, I know what you mean. We shot a just a, a movie production, and the performers are two feet away from me, and I can just shoot the whole time, yeah. not disturbing them at all. It was it was a surreal experience and really a very unique thing because I've never been able to do that before. I would never do that before, right? You'd be across the room with a long lens, or you would just have to wait for yeah, for or you're dragging around a giant blimp with it, which still wasn't a oh, hundred yeah. percent because um, yeah, you could still see. You know, that shutter clicking, the lens stopping down out of the corner of an actor's eye or something was still oh, a little that's interesting. distracting. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, here I've got a small camera taking pictures. There's no noise. There's no indication I'm even shooting. I didn't even know <laughs> at the time that thing is so fast. So, yeah, it was it was really quite a, quite a new experience. But me. it is funny because we're seeing, like, Nikon making, they're really pushing, like, D850 shoot silent or, you know, like, the G9 shoot silent, um, A7 III. But the rolling shutter on those cameras is so bad that for a lot of work it would make them basically unusable. Yeah. Like, you know, mm -hmm. if you're shooting sports or something like that, or, you know, we mentioned the backswing. I would yeah. never shoot that with a camera with bad rolling shutter. It's sure. always Circular going, golf yeah. clubs, yeah. Yeah, it's going to yeah. look like they're slinging a garden hose around. <laughs> <up>. <laughs> well, I, and I saw that out of the, actually the coverage of some local golf tournaments this summer that were being shot with a, with a Fuji mirrorless camera right. where, the, you know, got a curved golf club. Yeah, yeah. or hockey just sticks just trying to actually bent and that stuff. That silent yeah. shutter. Yeah. So they have to kind of fine tune that aspect of it. Sure. Right now, it seems like only Sony has cracked the code on that. Well, Sony's obviously uh, developed incredible image processing prowess. Um, the electronics driving that 20 frames per second, no, no blackout yeah. uh, mm. view that you have when you're shooting with that camera. It is, it is tremendous. The quality of the images is also really good. But they still have plenty to learn about building a camera. Right, yeah, that for is sure. All the, right. the, the parts that your hand interact with 
mm -hmm. uh, they, there's a lot of work to be done there. Mm -hmm. For instance, on the A9, having the back autofocus button so close to the video record button yes. and have virtually no tactile difference between Jordan the two. Jordan had a real hard time with that. Yeah. 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 It, is, it is things like that that are, um, if you are in the business of capturing spontaneous moments, and you need the camera to work with you in the aid of doing that, the, the A9 is a camera whose flaws you in part have to overcome. Right. As compared to, you mentioned the, the D850, the, the interface on that camera, oh, where the buttons and the controls are and, and yeah. how, how they work is phenomenal. Yeah. And then other things that Nikon has done by virtue of being a true camera company. I mean, having the way they've implemented auto ISO, mm -hmm. I mean, it's 10 years ago that they first oh, yeah. did that, yeah. is, is fantastic. Um, the the way now on the D850, D500, D5, the way the autofocus the autofocus control works, and the fact you can have that one button also not only move the autofocus point around, but also engage the autofocus yeah. if you want. Well, here's a question. So I know that um, you've been slinging around incredibly heavy cameras for decades, right? You know what that's like, and and we're getting now a lot of people on the market, not journalists, but you know hobbyists, landscape mm. photographers. Mm. They're really appreciating the mirrorless movement just for the weight savings and the smaller size, you know, travel, hiking up mountains, that kind of thing, right? Less to carry. Uh, we're even starting to see it in the wildlife world, you know, with micro mm. four thirds and people starting to look at, hey, I can get smaller lenses, I can still get 800 mil equivalents. Sure. Do you see uh, that downside though? Is, is that small size a downside as far as handling goes and ergonomics? Or I should also say, is having a smaller camera a benefit for a journalist or not really? I th well, I think the priority is having a camera that you can operate quickly and effectively and intuitively. Mm -hmm. And if that can be done in a smaller camera body, great. Hmm. It's just that I have yet to, I've yet to encounter a, a smaller camera body that has the characteristics that I just described. Right. right. And I think this is partly based on hand size for sure, but it also seems to be based on, on the notion that you have to have a certain amount of real estate on, on the camera to body. Put some yeah. distance between them so there yeah. is some real. Hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. certainly something I struggled with with the A9. And we're seeing that because uh, the Panasonic G9, they're like, this is the camera that we're going to put target towards professional photographers. And it's a very large body for a mirrorless sure. camera, but it hmm. feels fantastic in the hmm. hand. Hmm. Um, so very quick and easy to get at the essential right. controls. Where you look at something like, uh, say, the Olympus EM12. You know where they're still. We want to make this a really small professional mm -hmm. body, and I struggle with that constantly. Um, I'd be curious. Right I mean, battery life has always been a downside of mirrorless, and that's getting fixed. But I'd be curious. Uh, the people at home, uh, I'm sure a lot of them are shooting mirrorless. So if anybody out there, I want to hear your complaints. I want to hear the downsides. You know, we talk so much uh, in our show and in the store. Uh, we talk up mirrorless a lot. Mm -hmm. It's new. It's exciting. I think the industry is changing quite a bit you know SLRs are in decline and mirrorless is mm. growing and I, I think that depends on your clientele but yeah. I'd want to hear what do people feel is maybe a downside of mirrorless you know where do we where do we still need to improve those things yeah. so, so if anybody has those complaints I know you probably love your camera but I still want you to tell what you don't like about it yeah. that would be interesting so and any other like. questions that we've got for Rob too we've yeah. uh, we've we've gone on a little bit here right off the top but mm. You can keep actually uh, carrying on. Uh, everyone's having their kind of independent discussions. No, <laughs> it's just like your classroom. Nobody's really They're paying just attention. Passing notes back. <laughs> <and> forth, right? <laughs> good. Good. Then I'm I'm right at home yeah, here. There you go. Excellent. <laughs> so the other thing I could see really, um, and why I was surprised it took so long for a lot of the journalists to move over to mirrorless, is their better hybrid devices. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think that's mm -hmm. really debatable at this point. Right. Uh, if you and people have mm -hmm. to deliver mm -hmm. video now like sure. how much of what you're teaching touches on quickly moving between photo and video capture or is that something that you deal with quite a bit uh, for sure with it yeah with it within our program I mean a video is a is a big and growing component um, right. of it yeah, absolutely uh, but that said to to teach video at at the you know entry level so to do entry level document mm -hmm. like a short documentary piece yeah um, you can do that really just as well with a, an SLR as you can with, say, a, a, a hmm. Sony camera, hmm. for sure. In that the, there are certainly advantages, and then this is also would be true with a Nikon camera, which does not have uh, really very capable continuous autofocus in video oh, it's terrible. Versus, yeah. Yeah. versus Canon, it's awful, which yeah. does, but that doesn't really impact the way that students use their, hmm. their cameras in video mode initially. Hmm. 
Because what I would find certainly, and the reason that I don't use DSLRs anymore, is that the electronic viewfinder I find essential for working as a one-man band. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not needing to use support, actually being able to see my frame properly, and the stability that it brings mm -hmm. um, is the main reason I've always said, like, they keep pumping video features onto DSLRs, and I think that was great for a while when there were no right. alternatives. Mm -hmm. Now I really see, and I mean, I talk to people all the time. Actually, this is a great example. I was just at the Banff Mountain Film Festival, mm -hmm. um, and there I teach a, um, well, I, I work as well with a few other amazing teachers on a um, adventure filmmaking workshop, and it's high level. It's expensive. People have to have a good reel to actually get into this class in the okay. first place. And uh, two years ago, it was 100% Canon DSLRs that the students mm -hmm. brought in for this. Last year it was about two thirds Canon DSLRs, and this year was exclusively Sony. Um, wow. Okay. Um, so it's happened that quickly, where I think people are starting to realize, like, if you want to move quickly and not have the supports with you, mirrorless are currently giving you hmm. a better option for that. And that's why I was kind of surprised that you know we were seeing that transition a little slower. Um, you know, someone like uh, Carrie Ann um, Sproul, mm. I mm. believe I'm pronouncing that right. Sure. Um, has been on the Panasonic GH series for quite a while, but seems to be kind of alone in that, um, from what I've seen. Uh, so that did surprise me for sure. Well, within the within my uh, my program at Sate, it is it is definitely a still photo first program. Right. So video it, right. video is important. Uh, there's there's no question about that. But in terms of the the gear that they are required to purchase, mm -hmm. they, there is an emphasis on making mm -hmm. sure that they will have they will have the tools they need to capture still Stills. good still photos. You know, your students are going to be mostly young people, right? You're yes. saying like 18 to 20, 21 kind of thing, yes. right? So, are they coming into these classes now with a different mindset about what cameras they want to use, or do they ask you about mirrorless? They say like. Mr. Galbraith, oh, I don't know. They call you Mr. Galbraith. They call me Rob. Yeah, they call yeah. you Rob. It's so like, you know, Rob. Do I want to? Do I want to get a mirrorless? Should I be looking at Fuji? Do you get those questions? Sure. Yeah. Uh, from a pretty small minority, but okay. it, uh, of of students who are coming in, but nevertheless, that those questions definitely do come up, and as well as though we have a gear requirements for both the first year of the program as well as the second year of the program, and they are pretty stringent. And right yeah. now, they are exclusively Canon and Nikon based. Right. Uh, there, there will be students who do come into the first year of the program with, uh, you know, in, in, insert mirrorless brand here, um, and well, actually, without exception, they end up switching, and, right. that, and that has been based on. In fact, that happened. We had a, uh, just a couple of weeks ago where a student was trying to use a Fuji XT2. Okay, which is a very uh, capable mm, camera. Yeah. yeah. But it was clear to him, I think, that mm. that with what he was going to have to do with that camera, including shooting and shooting sports, right. uh, that that um, as well as use uh, flash a fair bit, that that camera was probably going to hold him back. Right. Which I which I would agree with. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would absolutely agree with. I think we have to remember too, in journalism, it's different than than some other kinds of photography where you have to have absolute confidence in your gear, right? It's the kind of job where yep. you need to know exactly where all your buttons are. You have to have absolute confidence that when you push the shutter, it's going to do what you need it to do. Brand maybe doesn't become so important. It's really like, I just need a tool that works day in, day out. So if there's any sort of lack of confidence or any sort of worry True. or or any sort of lack of speed or something, that that is a factor, right? And there, Yes, absolutely. And within our, within our program, uh, it's it's unique in that it is both writing students and photography students that come right. in the first year. So we take in about 100 students, and in the second year they will uh, split off into writing and photo specific right. streams. But in the first year, everyone takes all the same courses, which means the writing students take photo courses, the photo students take writing, writing courses, courses and, right. and so on. Hmm. Uh, and so we need to be able to recommend camera systems that students can grow with. Um, and so what you just said is really is true about the importance of having a, having a camera that you can rely on. But the fact is that uh, when students who have identified themselves as writers, but they have to buy gear that will enable them to complete their photo work, mm -hmm. they tend to come in with Canon Rebel cameras. Right. And so this is not a, this is not a high end model. If you look at the, the specifications for Rebel cameras, mm -hmm. they're, you know, they are entry level entry models. Level sure. But the fact is that they are able to do good work with those. They, mm -hmm. they produce a lot of in focus pictures, correctly exposed pictures with good color. Mm -hmm. um, they're able to grow with those cameras to the point where for instance, in the second semester of the first year, we will begin talking about using off-camera flash. Right. And right. so we're not doing that with wireless radio triggers 
in the first year. We're just using the built-in support yep. in the camera. So with, with a Rebel camera, you just flip up the pop-up flash. Fire it up. Very yeah. simple configuration on both the, the camera and the flash, and then you're mm -hmm. off to the races. And you're learning to use off-camera flash. Well, and I think this is an area that a lot of those other companies have misstepped, is everyone has built their off-camera flash system from the higher end down, um, hmm. which yep. I think, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's great if you've started in that camera system and worked your way up to the top, but yeah, it mm -hmm. makes it very difficult for someone like those students, or honestly, even like hobbyists who want to take better family photos or something mm -hmm. like that, like, oh great, I've got this Fuji X-T20, but now I've got to buy a $700 flash if I want right. to control, plus I need a transmitter for that, yep. um, you know, as opposed to just the more basic solution, well, not basic, but less expensive solutions that Canon and Nikon offer. And they're starting to address it, but we see this so much with the mirrorless cameras, like Sony's lens line as well. Mm -hmm. Spectacular lenses, if you're willing to pay over $2,000 for every right. lens. They've started at the high end up, and you look at the success of something like the A6000, Fuji X-T10, there's a ton of interest in people getting entry-level stuff, but there's not a lot of accessories, not a lot of glass for that. They have to build up the bottom, I think, is something they're really missing. And something Panasonic and Olympus have done a much better job at is the lower level and mid-range stuff. But still, Panasonic's flash system is not great. You know, uh, Olympus's is not either. So they've got to figure that out. What's up, Ron? Uh, well, we this is actually sparking a lot of conversation amongst everyone. There's no real questions oh, directed. Oh, us! I know. <laughs> uh, but I've one person, uh, John Bush, is saying Thank you, he's, John. He's not talking <laughs> to you, Jordan. Okay. Uh, he's more directed at Rob. He's so happy to see Rob on TCS TV Live. Uh, still have his old website, Digital Photography Insights, bookmarked on my browser in hope that he would one day resurrect his <laughs> online presence. Thank you for continuing to be the one visitor every month. I appreciate it. <laughs> it was for years my favorite photo website, so no questions for me right now. Just a big thank you to Rob for his excellent work on contributing so much to the photography conversation on the net. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate else? that. Yeah, well, let's see on there who else remembers reading that website. I'm for insight at robgalbraith.com. Let's see. I missed the um. We didn't have the um oh. in the last live show. Hey. You know, no, so, someone asked, like, who's farting, but, like, that was pretty much, yeah. That was the high bar yes, of that discourse. Was, that's the high, I mean, yeah. No, so, because people... I people, was not. People are, <laughs> people are talking about, uh, well, a sparking conversation in context of uh, what is indeed better for a working professional, mirrorless, or the conventional DSLR. A lot of people, or a couple, were saying uh, more so that... Uh, you won't look as professional if you're not carrying around a larger DSLR. And uh, I, you know, I, let's think less, I think that's less of a concern for journalism, right? Like for commercial, I can absolutely see that. I, I mean, how important is it for journalists? I mean, we do not, get that a lot. Mm, not at all, right? Not at all. Yeah. It is entirely how you carry yourself rather right. than the gear that you're carrying that is that is going to enable you to get access to what you need to access to, to that is going to enable you to get the kind of reactions that you need right. from people that might be at an event. It is 100% oh, yeah. what you what you say and the confidence that you project. Right. And you look at you look at a, a, a real photojournalist gear, and that stuff is beat to hell. Like there's nothing pretty about it anymore. <laughs> the, the brand's been taped over, and everything's all black gaffer tape and beat up and just yeah. scratched all to hell. So you've met yeah. Mike Drew. I've yes. met Mike Drew. Yeah, yeah. This is Mike Drew. His gear is just just brutal, right? Like just brutal. So. Yeah, being uh, being pretty grabbing attention, that's really the last thing journalists want to do. But we do hear about it in the commercial field. We hear about it in the in the wedding field, right? Um, I would argue that there's plenty of commercial photographers who bought medium format cameras, not because they needed it, but because it gave something to their clients. Yeah. It gave them the art director is like, I need a medium format camera for yeah. this because I'm a big I deal. won't shoot anything yeah. less than a house. But yeah, but it certainly could be true. It plays a factor. And, you know, and I know that with mirrorless, people are like, oh, these look like toys. These look silly. But didn't we have that same issue? Back uh, when medium format was transitioning to 35 millimeter, and, and you know, and all I mean, the artists sure. are saying, "Oh, you need TLRs to shoot weddings. You you need Hasselblads. You can't use that Leica. You can't use that Nikon." Um, that took a while for for journalists and photographers to start saying, "No, actually, 35 mil does give us uh, this new kind mm -hmm. of, of photo." Are we are we not just experiencing another transition like that today with mirrorless from from digital? Well, quite possibly, but I mean, if you look at a at an A9 versus say a uh, a D850. 
obviously they have a very different design, a very different aesthetic, mm -hmm. but I don't know that the D850 looks more professional than the, the A9. Right. And gosh knows if you put, if you put an 8514 on either one, that's a that's plenty of. Kit. That's all you're going to see yeah. anyways. Yeah, that's plenty big, of kit big that, round lens that, that you're pointing at at you know at your subject or you have slung over your shoulder. So so yeah, I agree. Um, I want you to weigh in on a debate Chris and I have been having for two years now. Oh jeez. Um, next year, Canon <laughs> and Nikon are both releasing their professional mirrorless cameras. They both possibly we don't know that for sure. No, they've both said yeah. it's coming out in 2018. I'll believe it when I see it. They're going to try and stop I, the bleeding. I, I already, a little I already bit. have both, one of each. You guys don't. <laughs> Damn, let's give Rob everything. Oh, okay, so yeah. what do you think about it? Yeah. Um, do you think it makes sense for them to start a brand new lens mount or make a camera with the same flange distance that just happens to have an electronic viewfinder and all the perks of a mirrorless camera? Like the zero blackout, the silent shooting, all that other stuff. It would, I guess it will depend in large part on how good the adapter is right. that enables you to bridge that, bridge mm -hmm. that gap. Uh, but since as an owner of a whole bunch of F-mount lenses uh, that are really nice lenses, I would prefer uh, to be able to just insert a great Nikon mirrorless body into, into, that, e ecosystem. into that ecosystem, absolutely. Sure, but yeah, so now Jordan thinks he's winning. But isn't, isn't that exactly <laughs> what, I mean, what about the Sony A series? I mean, that, that is effectively an EVF style SLR. Using a traditional SLR mount and that thing is going the way of the dinosaur, we know it is. Um, well, but I think a lot of that is due to the fact that there's not many people with A-mount lenses kicking around. You know, those are the people who are so vocal and love it so much, they've made that investment. It's a hell of a lot more people with a lot of money in Canon and Nikon that I think adapters, and we've seen this before, they're not bulletproof. Even the Canon EOS M adapter, which is made by Canon for those same lenses going on the M5, which has a capable autofocus system. Sometimes it's like the autofocus just stops for a second sure. or your stabilization shutters or something. I it's just, not bulletproof. I yet. think you can do, I think the reason I, I disagree is I think, you know, first off the smaller size appeals to people. I think the the ability to have I would lens. interrupt say that the smaller size I think appeals to some people. some people sure but there are others yeah, for talking. whom for whom uh, there is a higher priority and the higher priority Fine. is two against one hold up your hand Chris <laughs> yeah it's two against one can, can someone get Chris a white no, flag no here's the thing too here's the thing too you know if we if you're going to the smaller flange distance it changes your optical formulas you can do some interesting stuff adapters aren't yeah you're right necessarily ideal but I think if they do come up with professional mirrorless cameras and a good selection of new lenses, I think that'll actually be the more favorable way forward. We've so seen I think, I think that making an SLR body with an EVF will be a stopgap. It'll be a band-aid in between a transition. Well, and I've always been curious about that because I mean, the classic example is the Canon EF mount where they pissed yeah. off a ton of people, but it wound up being the right move in the end. Um, sure. However, that was back when Canon was on it with a lot of you know, they were bringing out technology that hadn't been seen before at that point, where at this point, they're playing catch up with mirrorless. Does it make, does it behoove them to just have that Band-Aid solution right now, uh, making it a fully EF mount system and not irritate their viewers, right? Behoove. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yay, uh, okay, so we've got, we've got a <laughs> bunch of questions that have popped up. Behoove One, is a toast phrase, be people. <laughs> uh, Bom <laughs> I've got Bomber here uh, saying, answering quiz Chris's question, the only downside I see to mirrorless is the size of the zooms. Uh, to have small zooms, uh, you have uh, to use a micro four thirds. If you go up to full frame, the size of savings for DSLR is neg negligible. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. uh, Arnie is saying, uh, Fuji brings a 200 F2, seems an odd choice, uh, heavy, bulky, expensive. What do you think? Is this what pros want to uh, do or destroy their um, USP, compact, affordable, easy to use? I think just to answer that quick, I think I, I feel like Fuji is trying to be the front runner on having lots of good long glass because sure. the other manufacturers don't. I mean, mm. I, I don't want to lump Panasonic in that. They have some really nice long glass too, but Micro Four Thirds, everybody kind of views as a different world altogether. Sure. Uh, but yeah, I think Sony is the big thing. Fuji knows that Sony don't have long glass right now and they're, they're slow to really perform in that regard. Yeah. So I think that's why Fuji just jump in over all these beautiful long lenses. Plus they can, they just have the optical science to be able to do it yeah. well. Well, and you look at it, it's a, they've really said, we're only doing APS-C, we're not interested in the full frame world right now. So getting that 200 yeah. F2, it's gonna be big, but that's your 300 28, which is a staple lens. Yeah. Uh, sure. I think that's kind of smart where what so we're seeing with Sony so much, they've got to support APS-C and full frame. 
So they're like, oh, we'll just throw a truckload of full frame glass out there, but it's not the most appropriate focal lengths right. for APS. And we're seeing a lot of teleconverters coming out now too, just as a side point for yeah. the mirrorless. So that's that's interesting. Uh, Bill's wondering. Hey, Bill. Rob, do you recommend uh, use bodies and glass as affordable options for budding photojournalists? Which gear? If yeah. A absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There, there's no reason to buy new if you can. If you can. Shh. <laughs> look around you. <laughs> we look sell, where you are. Well, I believe there is we a used, used department. <laughs> we, we sell In fact, used soon things. there will be. Actually, I, have, I will soon have two camera bodies for sale. So what I'm selling there actually would be the <laughs> ideal tool. <laughs> He'll be later posting it on <laughs> yeah, his website. But he's a photo yeah. driller, so they just beat all to crap. Don't yeah. yeah, we've already addressed that. <laughs> well, the shutters have 250,000 shots on them. Uh, I, I can say this, that if uh, if I had to pick from, from uh, mid-range level cameras that are available today, that one camera that I would use, that I would take to a deserted island to make pictures, I'm not sure what I would make pictures of there, but, but if I had to pick one, it would be the Nikon D750. Mm. I think that is absolutely the best value in a full frame camera on, so the, on the market today. Yeah. And if you watch our survival show on our channel, you could take that D750 to a uh, desert island and then possibly survive for uh, about for quite two a week. Time. Yep. Make a knife out of it, build fishing hooks, all the rest. <laughs> yep. He I hadn't considered that element. That's good. Well, then you've got to know. watch this video, yeah. Rob. The camera won't take <laughs> pictures anymore, by the way. Yeah, show it to your students. <laughs> they might save their lives. Here, here's a somewhat charged question. Ooh, we uh, like charged questions. How has the demise of newspapers and the rise of internet affected uh, photojournalism? Seems to me like it would open up the field for more amateurs. I think that in a sense it has not, uh, it has not affected it at all in that there is still a need for, for people who can gather content um, at a professional level, people who have the skill and training to, to make sure that they are doing truthful storytelling right. uh, mm -hmm. with their cameras. So certainly the, I mean, the rise of digital photography when, the, when that transition from film to digital, that had an impact on the, well, the professional photography world in general, right. and certainly on, on those uh, on things that would be related to to photojournalism, including sports photography, mm -hmm. uh, but I think, but what has remained true throughout is that is that a photographer with training and skill and the right gear can simply do a better job, and that's mm -hmm. that's 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 true today, and that's true certainly also with in the with the fact that the that newspapers right now are going through a really really hard transition. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if you look at the state of Canadian newspapers, it's hard to be optimistic about. Um, about where the daily newspapers in particular are going to be at in five right. years time. Right. But there has never been a greater demand for the content mm -hmm. that the, well, the, both photographers and writers that work for newspapers produce. And so given that there's a demand, it's going, there is going to be a way for those, uh, those content right. producers. Yeah. So journalism is yeah. not going to be replaced by every amateur with a cell phone giving their own content. It, yeah. but, but how we view that is going to change. Well, how, we, how we receive that is going to change. Well, and, the, and the, the business model has yet to be fully figured out. Right. Yeah. Particularly at the local level. You know, the New York Times, the Washington Post, yeah. they seem to be on their way. Right. But what works for them d isn't necessarily right, going to work, work for, for, for a mid-sized daily of the kind you're going to find in a, you know, a city like, like Calgary. Like Calgary. Yeah, well, and absolutely. we hear so much about citizen journalism as the future, mm -hmm. but I, mean, I think one of the biggest things that you'll learn that a professional really embraces is those standards, you know, yep. journalistic standards. It's so easy for someone to you know, Photoshop an image or something like that, submit it to a newspaper, and they're like, oh, we're going all to citizen journalism and stringers and stuff like that. And, um, and, and equally important is actually the information that is supplied along with the picture. Right, yes. Yeah. yeah. You, need, you need someone with... You need with the context and you need the story. Yeah. Yeah. And someone with journalism training um, yeah. in that regard. So, but I don't see as one, like I don't see citizen journalism as replacing professional journalism. No. If you look at the fires in Fort McMurray, the, the great majority of, of the powerful images that were coming out in the immediate aftermath of the fire, those right. were coming from, not from journalists, but from people who were who were unfortunately right. yeah. living yeah. through that experience, those pictures are really important to have. Right, and it's and so it's so great that that the the iPhone, <laughs> etc., um, exists to enable people to do that. Gotcha. But but then if you look at all the all the coverage that came after the initial photos of, of the course, fire yeah. that went on for the week weeks and months, that was done by professional. 
journalists, right, and, that, right, right. and that was really important. Where they're actually telling the story now, yep. know, communicating the story. Ron? Ron's waving his hands, so what's up, Ron? I've been waving it for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been ignoring. So this one's for Rob and not you guys. That's uh, great. We want questions for Rob. <laughs> yeah. We don't, want to, we don't know anything. Uh, there you go. Uh, for a substantial period in history of photography, the the Leica report, Leica in, in general, was a notable mirrorless presence in photojournalism. Where do you see Leica in the current scene of photojournalism? Well, not really. <laughs> yeah. They're not not really a presence in photojournalism much at all anymore. I mean, I think that and I don't think the company is trying to be just based on the yeah. price of their gear. They are they're pursuing a different kind of customer and, and more power to them. Sure. Yeah, I think you got to remember the context, you know, during like the 60s and Vietnam and whatnot. Cameras were manual focus. You could go with a Leica. You could go with a Nikon FM. Yeah. You know, it didn't really matter. Um, it was more of a personal preference. But now, yeah, they're just, you're right. They can't compete with, with the capabilities that we need nowadays. Well, and if well, you needed it for what the Leicas were famous for was that quiet shutter and the small size, you can get that, but in a, you know, yeah. much more, well, less expensive body. Um, but something that'll also give you autofocus, video capture, all those other things that are becoming important. So I, th I think uh, what's what's key to me is I think that Leica simply has stopped pursuing that right. yeah. that that end of the market. So if they chose to, could they do something that was as good or better than everybody else? Quite possibly, given their pedigree. But th I think they've just decided they're, they're aiming it for a classic experience and a, and a different kind of uh, feel. And they're a small company; like they're making it work very well because mm -hmm. they have limited production. So why not go up market if mm -hmm. they can't make enough to fill supply anyways? They can't make enough seven thousand dollar thirty five. Sumacrons, right? So, so I kind of want to try and go mainstream. I kind of want to go back to kind of what we just touched on. Um, Apple tens out. The Google Pixel Two is out. All getting very good reviews mm -hmm. on their image quality. What role does? And we talked about citizen, you know, journalism stuff. But what role does the phone play in in the journalist job? Because I assume it has become an essential thing. We always talk about amateurs taking pictures, but what about as a photojournalist? And especially with the students mm -hmm. that you have, how do phones play a part in their world now and in this whole storytelling? Well, I think in, in two key ways. First one I would mention is actually there a, a greater benefit to a, a writer, reporter, who wants to to gather content to go with the stories that they're writing about. And then, and then it would be more in the, in the realm of uh, video content. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, uh, this year in, in my program, we will teach the second year writing students about how to use Videolicious. Um, mm -hmm. an app that, is, that is, uh, enables uh, someone to go to an event and shoot a bit of A-roll, a bit of B-roll, combine it together all with a few taps on the screen and, and upload it. Right. So I think that is, um, that is absolutely uh, fantastic. For a photojournalist, certainly that, that, uh, that could also be true, but I think what is more, maybe I'll answer it this way, what's more interesting to me is how you can use the always on internet connection that you have in your pocket right, now right. to move pictures from your, uh, from your uh, professional camera um, onto someone who is paying you for those pictures. So is that interface, that Wi-Fi connectivity, is that really benefiting the, the journalism world? Is that something you're using on a day-to-day -day basis? Massively. 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 Right? Yeah. So if anything, you'd like to see that part get more streamlined, quicker, faster transfer rates, all that kind of stuff. Anything anything that, that could make that work better yeah. is, is great. Yeah, I would love to see something where you can just, it's already set up, like Samsung had for a while, where it was already set up to your Instagram or your Twitter account or whatever in the back of your camera, you just tap it, it sends it up directly instead of send the file to the phone, to the thing. It'd be great to streamline that process a little That's bit. That's well, lots and lots and lots of money. Yeah. Are there, are there any stories well, about- Well, actually, I, I'm just, I would jump in there to say that that reality is perhaps closer than you think mm -hmm. in that I, uh, if you have a camera like the D750 or 5D Mark IV, with, with, uh, both of which have great built-in wireless, right? yeah. and you have an iOS device, such as an iPhone, and you have uh, Shutter Snitch, the, the app, you can set that up so that you go, you go click, picture goes to your phone in your pocket, and then is automatically renamed, captioned, and mm -hmm. uploaded to a bunch of different places, to an FTP server, to Dropbox, to Google Drive, to various other services. That can happen all automatically and effectively. Do you see uh, cameras with built-in internet connectivity being a desirable thing? Or do you think it's still gonna go through an intermediary like your phone? Gosh, uh, 
I think if you'd asked me, say, five years ago, I would say have the built-in internet, connect, internet connect connectivity would be ideal. Mm -hmm. But the, the scenario that I just described actually works really well. Right. Cool. So having that, just using the phone as the, as the pass-through. Right. It, it works fine. I still think you should just be able to snap your phone into the back of a camera body and have it as an all-in-one <laughs> device that's also your interface because the screens are better on these than everything else out there. Video, video guy. Yeah, that's too much. That's <laughs> too <laughs> much. Uh, go, go then you're asking, you're asking large <laughs> multinational Asian companies to get along with yep. each other. There and you then go. That's all right. Uh, Samuel would like you to talk about publication in photojournalism because newspaper prints are low res and digital files are small when published online. Does do megapixels matter in the end game of publishing? Yes, absolutely. In that, when you shoot a picture, almost regardless of the context, but this would include a photojournalism context, you don't know what all the end uses of that picture are going to be. And so you might be shooting a picture that you, at the time you're shooting it, all you know about is that it's going to be that big in a web gallery. Right. Uh, but other uses come along that could be in the following week or could be in years to come, including someone, uh, someone would like to use that picture, you know, uh, 36 inches high on a poster. Sure. And so it's, it's important uh, that you have megapixels yeah. for that. But having said that, you don't need 45, you don't right. need 36, in fact, my goodness, you can do an awful lot with a really crisp 60 megapixel file. So I'm definitely not advocating more and more right. megapixels Keep forever. 24 yep. is again kind of our perfect, nice mix, I think, right now. Yep. Yeah. I'm partial yeah. to always more megapixels because you never know if there's going to be a murder or something in the background that people will have to see us uh, crop in Zoom and right solve in. the mystery. Yes. I think this says something about your neighborhood more than yes. more than anything. We've been, yeah. we've been out of Dover sometime. We've been watching a lot of Mindhunter <laughs> lately, so I think we're just going to... Uh, that mindset, really. Um, yeah. Good show, by the way. What else we got there? Right? Fantastic show. <laughs> Excellent uh, cinematography. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Go Fincher. <laughs> what can't Many professional photojournalists are now being equipped exclusively with smartphones. What do you think of that? Um, I think that I don't agree with that statement. That if, that is, I don't. I don't think that there are professional photojournalists. Certainly not not uh, that I've come across in any quantity that are only being equipped with, with smartphones. Uh, certainly reporters mm -hmm. yes. are being expected to do more and more with their smartphones, and that's where that happens. I think that's the distinction, yeah. 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 yeah, there's reportage, there's photojournalism, these are different worlds, yeah. yeah. It is interesting, we've seen, we've seen some of the media outlets like CBC and stuff trying mm -hmm. to do these exclusive cell phone only mm -hmm. shows, and, and, and they look terrible, but I'm sure it'll get better. Yeah. But cameras constantly moving, all this kind of stuff. Are there any stories though of where a journalist, a photojournalist has had to resort to their phone? Uh, y yes, well, and certainly whether it's a professional photojournalist or whether it's been a citizen photojournalist uh, or journalist, right? Um, there, are, um, there are certainly some, some uh, really memorable pictures uh, that have come out of that. I'm, to an I'm not sure that I can come up with an example right now to your specific question. Like the camera's failed but, or it's been broken uh, or whatever, uh, and all you have left is your phone. I'm sure that's <laughs> happened. Nothing is, nothing is coming to mind right now. But I think of the, the most compelling pictures that came out of uh, when the airplane landed on the Hudson River yeah. uh, in New right. York a few years ago. Those were, I think, exclusively iPhone pictures, and they were, they were tremendous. Yeah, like, I don't think we yeah. want to ever come up with some attitude online or you know, throughout the ether that photojournalists hate phones and they're this huge problem and, oh, no, you know, it's ruining our jobs and stuff. Like, I don't think, and, and I think maybe from the outside, that's what people assume, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, you must be so upset. Phones are taking over. You guys are dead. You're all out of jobs, blah, blah, blah. And that's not the case at all. Um, nope. And, and at the at same all. time, there's something unique about having this small camera that can capture these very real life moments right after they happen, right? Yep, absolutely. Either that or photojournalists have to embed themselves in every single event that ever <laughs> happens in the hope that something terrible <laughs> they can capture it, <laughs> which is not a nice way to live either, Sonny. I think um, it's funny because uh, what we found a lot, and even in YouTube and things like that, is a lot of people on the video side are kind of correlating low production values with reality in a big way. Right. And we don't see that as much with stills, which I find very interesting. You know, nobody looks at an expertly shot, you know, technically mm -hmm. good piece of photojournalism and says like, that's overproduced, I don't believe that. Hmm. But if you, uh, and this is why we're seeing things like CBC shooting all their shows on smartphones, is people are correlating like, hmm. oh, it looks like garbage, so it must be real. Why do you think there's that divide between the two right now? 
Do you have any idea? I because I can't I piece it together. I like good nope, looking stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you're uh, you're working every day to try to to instruct people to not be that way, right? I mean, sure. to to have an attitude of you got to take this seriously. This is about our craft. This is about producing right. high end content. Yeah. Well, I suppose when it seems more immediate, that can somehow make it seem more real. Right. That is, if it, if it and so that might be an, a partial explanation in any way mm -hmm. for what you're describing with C, with CBC. Yeah. But I have no additional insight beyond that. I have a quick question. Just a quick question. Quick question. Because I'm kind of curious about this. Uh. You know, with the, I know Ron. With the new students coming in, you know, when when I was a kid, at least. Um, our heroes were, you know, the the James Noctways and the you know Sebastian Salgados and and um, has that changed? Ding ding ding! I yeah, have, oh, there I, you go. The, the, you, Someone you asking the same it. question. Uh, are kids nowadays quest. like who are their heroes? Who do they still look to the old stuff? Are they like are these journalism kids going through like old Nat Geos and being like, oh, I want to be like this guy, I want to be like this person, this woman, like these journalists, or, or do they have their modern day photographers that they more they more follow off of? But wait. There's more. Okay. Uh, Good. The, Good. The question that follows is, uh, what's James Noctway doing these days? Uh, has the internet age made it difficult for the old guard of photojournalists to keep a presence? It doesn't seem like it to me. I mean, I can't. I don't know what James Noctway is doing. You know. Yeah. Today. Exactly. Uh, right. He's uh, he's but, watching the show. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> yeah. Let us know. We, we could hope. Uh, I'm sitting oh. at home. Uh, maybe to. To your question, uh, the students come in with mainly with I would say a passion for photography, hmm. but not necessarily the the a strong sense of what photojournal photojournalism is about or who the you know who the gods are right uh, with within that world. So definitely, uh, I along with uh, with Kevin and Greg, the other two photo yep. instructors, we do definitely see it as part of our you know our mandate to introduce them to. Great. Well, great photography wherever it comes from, but that certainly will mean uh, mean looking oh, yeah. at the work of James Knockway, as just as just mentioned, and and others in the old guard. But also certainly, well, Steve, we look at we look at a lot of pictures shot by Steve Simon. Mm, right. You know, as uh, just as a for instance, a good good Canadian photographer right. now now making his way very effectively in in New York. All right, all right. So really trying to show everything, all yeah. the photography. Yep, 20s, absolutely. 30s, 40s, 50s, into today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, to show to show the to show the roots of photojournalism, and then also show how it's being practiced so effectively today. Hmm. There we go. Uh, whew. Can photos or photojournalists ever be truly objective? All images have some in, uh, <laughs> intentional inclusion or exclusion of the frame lines. I mean, beyond the intentional disingenuousness. Uh, is the medium fundamentally biased? Uh, to some extent, sure. Uh, in that, just by your mere presence there, you you yeah. can be having some influence over over what's taking place. So I think that uh, well, what I talk about with students is that they need to do what they can to not mislead the viewer. And if you keep that in mind, then you will. I th you may never perfectly achieve that objective. But you would hope to mm. to come close as close as as possible um, most of the time, as long as you keep that in mind. Yep. Well, looping yep. back to the earlier conversation, then something like the A9 is getting people closer to that end goal. They're becoming more invisible. They're influencing the situation less when they have something smaller and silent. As a it journalist, mm -hmm. as a journalist yourself, were you trying to show your experience in this moment that's happening, or were you trying to? Uh, take a picture that immerses the viewer in an experience. You know, like, were you trying to, do, do you know what I'm saying? Were you trying to be an intermediary for the viewer, or are you trying to say, this is my story as I saw it? Well, maybe a hybrid of the two, in that I think the, the, the best uh, spontaneous uh, moment photographers are ones that first observe an interesting thing and then figure out how to make their camera capture it. Mm -hmm. And so you will absolutely, therefore, see the personality of the photographer in the pictures that they capture. Hmm. So a particular, particularly funny photographer, that is if you're just talking to that photographer, right. you know, and he or she makes you laugh, chances are they're going to shoot funnier pictures. Hmm. It right. is just that you can't help but That's have the perspective. That, right? Yeah, that is their perspective and their personality will shine through um, um, in, in their work. So, but what was really instilled into me, particularly in the early days of working, working at the Calgary Herald, was the importance of trying to do truthful storytelling. Right. 
and it all really didn't matter what, it, what assignment that you were given. And incidentally, that would extend even to shooting portraits, mm -hmm. where portraits are kind of different than any, everything else you do as a, as a photojournalist, where for everything else, you are mainly reacting to what's taking place in front of you. Right. But for a portrait, you're in control. Right. And so that means you have the, the ability to manipulate things you know, for good or evil. And the idea is to still keep in mind you're trying to tell a truthful story about your portrait hmm. subject. Interesting. Um. And all of you art photographers, don't worry about that. The truth means nothing to you in photography. You can abstract it all you want. But <laughs> journalism <laughs> is different. It is an interesting <laughs> medium. I mean, because this viewer makes the point, I teach my students the same thing, is just, just by merely choosing to show uh, what you kept in the photo and what you excluded is your bias. It's your it's your abstraction. It's your choice. You've you've changed the photograph, but um, yeah, no, it's interesting. Photography's not all the same. <laughs> Luckily, <laughs> I know. Rob, uh, what camera would you suggest for war journalism? A bulletproof one. Yeah, there you go. Well, I think uh, durability. Someone, is, so, is, so, is, so, is, someone is, said is a D four. A D4? <laughs> Nikon yeah. D4? If only Pentaxes yeah. could focus. <laughs> <laughs> Close. Yeah, Close uh, certainly something, uh, durability is really important. So if you see yourself on, on the front lines, embedded, embedded with troops, bullets flying around, you need something that is durable. Uh, and so that really leads you to the, the top end cameras. Well, really from Canon or Nikon, because there isn't another, there isn't another brand that even if they are saying they are building, you know, uh, cameras that are really tough, they don't yet have the track record. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, if you're if you're going to be buying that one or those two bodies that you're going to go into a war zone with, it needs to it needs to be at the at the EOS one D class or the you know the the D class on the D like D four D five class on the Nikon side. When's the last time you heard someone even mention Pentax in a photojournalistic situation? Uh, just me when talking about the K1000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, the, the transition from film to digital photography certainly cemented Canon and Nikon at that. Yes, you know, absolutely. In the lead. And we're, we're obviously, we're seeing a potentially a different transition yeah. uh, again, where maybe, maybe Canon and Nikon are going to have to share the space. I know this is a tough yep. question, but yeah, do you see Sony a whatever's on the front lines at one point, do you, you know, in the future, in the near future, we should say, do you see Sony mirrorless cameras and Fuji mirrorless cameras embedded in these very difficult journalistic situations? Yeah, potentially. Yeah. And, it, and Sony has certainly made it clear that they are, go they are committing um, tremendous resources towards having a presence within photojournalism. They're focusing on sports photography, right. uh, first and foremost, because they, I mean, they have, they have said that they want Sony gear to have a significant presence at the 20, uh, the 2020 Olympics. Olympics. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, 2020 as well, yeah. Um, and whatever a camera maker does to improve their their gear for sports photography makes it better for everything else. Right, right. It really does. So that's the first step to, to getting into this uh, this whole market. Well, and well, well I mean, they, I, Sony almost certainly is viewing the Olympics as key for their marketing in the way that Canon and Nikon have long looked at the Olympics as key their marketing, their marketing yeah. efforts. So they want people on TV to see oh, yeah. them use, uh, see the the sidelines photographers using, you know, uh, if it's a Canon, they want they want uh, people on, uh, to see Canon shooters there. So that then they're not going to go and buy a one DX Mark II, right. but they will go and buy a Rebel. That's, yeah, I mean that's, that's exactly what happened in the '80s with Canon. That's mm -hmm. exactly what happened. Yep. And yep. then you 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 know literally have Andre Agassi playing with a Canon Rebel after that, and right. be like, I'm going to buy one. Yeah. So Sony Sony has clearly recognized that, mm -hmm. and they are clearly devoting their considerable resources to you know, that. towards making that happen. Whether it, whether it'll work out is you know is still an open I, it'll question. Work out. I think it'll work out. <laughs> Um, okay, I've got Arn asking, uh, at Rob, what do you think of Reuters' uh, JPG-only decision? JPEG-only. So the fact that they are, they are, that they, you have to, sub that essentially, sub that you must you have to have an yeah. original uh, picture JPEG. file coming. They, they don't want to work with RAW. Afterwards, after There's been the a lot fact. of controversy about people taking out things or yeah. editing yeah. things or cropping, changing that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think given that the wide variety of sources that, that an agency receives pictures from, including potentially freelance photographers that they don't have, that they don't necessarily have had a long association with, they, they, I think they made the only choice that they could. Right. Does the whole house collapse 
when we start to allow journalists to edit or change, or even in little ways? Well, we've seen this in the awards uh, year after year now, where you know an award-winning photograph winds up having been doctored in some way. So I think that it is the just a tiny, tiny minority of pictures that are being manipulated in the, manipulated right. in that way, and that the vast, vast majority of of photojournalists are ethical people. Right. Um, uh, I was at a workshop, Rich Clarkson workshop. Rich Clarkson's a former National Geographic editor. And there was an, a discussion about ethics that took place, and people were talking about s the specific, uh, specifics of this situation and that situation. And he just stopped the conversation and he said, you know what, ethical people do ethical things. Mm, right. Um, and that really stuck with me as a really kind of a, as a, as a good you know, guide for an approach to being a photojournalist. And my belief, based on the many photojournalists that I've worked alongside over the years, is that that is what drives them. They are right. ethical people, they are endeavoring to, to conduct themselves in an Truthful. ethical manner. Yeah. But unfortunately, there have been just, uh, just enough, you know, well, bad apples. Well, when those apples. stories get out, it blows up, right? Yep. It yeah. becomes everything's news. I, I can't help but think that, that some journalists were doing stuff like this in the film days too, right? I mean, there must have been doctoring and changing and, and fixing and editing, I mean, really. Uh, it's not uh, just a digital uh, thing. It's not like digital photography has opened up this Pandora's box of evil, unethical photography. <laughs> it, has, it hasn't made it possible, but obviously it's made it a lot easier. Easier, yeah. Right? yeah for sure. Yeah. That is, for me to do something uh, something evil to my pictures in the darkroom, I wouldn't actually know how. <laughs> right. Whereas in Photoshop, I definitely know how. I just choose not to. Right. right. Honest. Honest mom. I, I choose not to. <laughs> yeah. Honest Rob. Honest yeah. Rob here on the live show today with us. Yeah, that's documented now. So. <laughs> All right, guys, we've got uh, five minutes if oh. you want to make your closing thoughts. Yeah, perfect, and perfect. I will back. open the floor to speed round questions if anyone has any. So yes, have at it, YouTube. Yeah, this is your last chance. Ask questions. Ask questions you're wondering about. Uh, do you miss doing robgalbraith.com? Yes. Yeah, very much so. Yep, that, the, the website was a lot of fun. Uh, it was really uh, gratifying. Heard from so many, and particularly when I announced that it was going on hiatus, which was which turned out really to be you know the end. Yeah. Um, I heard from well tens of thousands of, of of photographers. It was the the response was incredible. I could I could I could barely read it all. Mm -hmm, right. uh, just people saying such nice things to me, and uh, and it was really it was it was really just well just so gratifying. And and it was and also through that ex that experience, just selfishly, I met so many interesting people. I got right, right. to do such interesting travel, um, and worked uh, worked with some people uh, that that previously had been friends that were worked on this endeavor together, and I just became that much closer to them. Right. When are you starting your own YouTube show? Uh, today. Oh, yeah, 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 today. This we're announcing that's why right you're on now. the show. This yeah. Is it, yeah. Honest Rob has now become selfish Rob. He's uh, <laughs> using as a springboard to boost his social media career. That's why these, gla uh, these glasses are modeled after Anderson Cooper. Right, yeah. Same thing. Right. Right. I, I don't actually have gray hair. <laughs> also, I've dyed it to look like Anderson Cooper. He's trying to get on CNN as soon as possible. Yeah. <laughs> do, um, <laughs> do you see yourself maybe doing something like that? I mean, what is your social media presence? Do you still like to get it zero? zero? Yeah, do you like yep. it that way? Uh, for now, yep. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the I made the transition for a number for a number of reasons. But one was I was looking to have a smaller, simpler existence. Yes. Sure. Uh, Absolutely. And I, I and the fact that now I am able to work one uh, quite often one on one with photographers, young photographers who are passionate about photography, mm -hmm. uh, but don't have any bad habits yet. Also, right. that's right, you know, that's right, very right. exciting. <laughs> um, and so. I wasn't exactly sure whether what the job of being a full-time photography instructor was going to be be like. I had some ideas of what 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 it would be like. Some of those turned out to be correct ideas. Some of them I was I couldn't have possibly been more wrong. Mm -hmm. But the net effect has been I really like what I do. Uh, really like what I do for a living. I really like working with young people. Uh, they tease me about being old all the time, but in fact they do keep me. Uh, they do keep me young. Uh, they teach me how to use uh, Snapchat. Right. Uh, they, <laughs> they snicker at me when I say AF. I mean autofocus, but the right. a AF means a different thing. If, if you're old like me, look it up. You'll see it does not mean it does not mean <laughs> autofocus. <laughs> I uh, think this entire YouTube chat room knows what auto. Yeah. Yeah. AF means. <laughs> yeah. I, I like to work with continuous AF mode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. I like hot autofocusing yeah, systems it, myself. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, Anything? This is not a speed oh, round. No, yeah, I, don't, not, I, would, I actually know. I want to know. Oh, okay. This is a quiet YouTube audience today, which you know, I like it. I want to know, um, cause, you know, with the students, with young people, and, and myself. Like I, obviously, we do the social media thing. It's hard for me to really get into it, you know, doing Instagram stories. I mean, I like posting my photos, you know, but I wouldn't say I'm like a big, as people know who follow me. Um, but how much does that influence the students nowadays? Because I feel like photographers coming into the field now, you almost have this um, obligation or, or responsibility that you've got to get on Instagram, put your photos up, try to get likes, get views. I mean, it's really kind of, it's, a, it's an interesting experience, but in some ways it's negative too, that you're always striving for, get those views, get my photos out there, talk about them, make important mm -hmm. comments. You know, how does that affect these young photographers when they're entering into this world of popularity and likes? Well, what I tell students is that having a social media presence is, is important, having a <laughs> website is important, but also that, that they will get work in 2017 the same way that I did in, in the 80s, those, those, those initial jobs, and that is through making connections with people, making direct connections with people. And that the way that you get work today is the same as back then, you make it clear to to a hire of photographers that you would like to do work for them. You like what they do and you would like to you would like to right. to be a part of that. Be a part of that. Mm. And so social media can play a part in that. But the fact is the students in the second year of the program who are who are beginning now to get paid work, the vast majority of that does not come from social media. It comes from you know so-called old-fashioned ways. They of just did an assignment in, in year one that people remember them like, oh, you did a good job. Yeah. We liked how you, you, how they, you were, they, how professional you were. Why don't you come back and do another job for us? Right, and then it, and then it spins off from there because right. they say we had a good ex we had a good experience with her. So uh, to some, they say that to someone else in their industry, and it just snowballs from there. Right. Cool. So the way you build a career in 2017 is really right. social media yeah. is is a part of it. Um, and perhaps for some photographers that are that are doing photography different than than what sure, I'm teaching, where it might you're be a bigger part of it. sponsorships and that kind of thing. Yeah, Run. Uh, yeah, the, where you should wrap since it's going to like start lagging like crazy. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, after okay. the fact, we we are timed out technically. Yeah, are we over yeah. time, yeah, guys? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, oh, so you. Anything yeah. else you want to throw in there, Ron? Well, the, the, I have one person asking, what do you think of the big sizes of the EM1 Mark II or the G9? Are they losing uh, their advantage over size? Uh, yeah, I think we touched on the that. The Micro yeah, Four yeah. Thirds? Um, I think they'll have a unique niche for wildlife photographers, <laughs> for people who want long lenses, but yeah. I don't I, know. Actually, w one last parting thought. Uh... <laughs> Uh -oh. Should 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 the income of the model uh, should the income model of the photojournalist change? Oh, so just a small question. Yeah, just yeah. a small <laughs> one. Because yeah. they know we're well, wrapping. We got a half so. hour, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, what remain what remains true is that when I was starting out, it was difficult to make a living doing just <laughs> photojournalism, whatever whatever that might, however you might define that. So that was true then, it is, is, it is as true now. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you really like to do just editorial photography, really like to do sports photography, you're not gonna be able to make a living doing just that. Mm -hmm. Can't do that today, couldn't do it before. Um, for, for the, except for you know, the elite, that's going right. to be true. So you have to be able to do commercial photography. You have to potentially be prepared to do things like weddings where uh, you're actually, you're, skills as a photojournalist really can, can be brought to bear nicely mm. on the shooting of weddings because the wedding wedding is ultimately just a kind of event sure right, at absolutely. its core yeah okay cool. um yes room the boys will review the sony rx uh mark IV or, or rx 10 IV. Mark IV. yes we will it's we, we will we've just so, been yeah. someone just sony someone, kick lately. Yeah. yeah it's too much sony and someone sold our demo so yeah. i don't have a camera to so <laughs> tell sony to stop making new yeah. cameras because we have the rx zero as well that we want to play with and Arcs 10 3, uh, 10 3, Arcs 10 4. 4. We still have an yeah. A9 video to put out in yeah. okay. 2019. It's too much probably. Sony. So, yeah. um, thanks gen a lot, gentlemen, Sony. thank you very much. Yeah. Rob, yes, thank you very on, much. Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for having me. And, yeah, and thanks, everybody, for watching. We will be back uh, again. We're posting our schedule on camerastore.com slash TCS TV. Yep. But uh, we'll be back in two yeah. weeks with another Ooh. live episode. And two if you've weeks? always dreamed about being a photojournalist, check out the SAIT program. Have a look at it. It is a very, very good program. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way to go. All right. Have a good Congrats. weekend, guys. See you later. Bye.